Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Rosanna Francescato, Communications Director with the Clean Coalition. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited today to host this webinar on open standard appliance orchestration. And that's because these open standard solutions are a really important part of our transition to renewable energy. So before we get into the details, I want to mention a few quick housekeeping items. First of all, we will email everyone the webinar recording and slides within a couple of business days. So you will be getting those in your inbox. Also, you can find those on our website, clean-coalition.org under events. If you have questions at any time during the webinar, please go ahead and type them in the questions pane at the right of your screen. We will try to answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A, which will follow the presentation. If you have questions about anything else, including about the Clean Coalition, you can contact me at rosanna at clean-coalition.org. We're lucky today to have two great presenters who are part of Tucson Electric Power's Project RAIN, or Resource Aggregation and Integration Network. Project RAIN studied how open standards help with installing and coordinating common consumer devices and DER like thermostats, water heaters, electric vehicle chargers, energy storage, and solar. So presenting today, we have Tristan DeFrandeville, CEO at Skycentrics. Tristan has more than 20 years of experience in software and hardware engineering management, and he's working on a number of regulatory and policy initiatives with a focus on enabling buildings and electric loads to support increased renewables on the grid. We also have with us today Craig Breeden, who is a lead integration engineer at Smarter Grid Solutions. Craig has extensive experience in power systems control as well as emerging protocols. So now I'm going to turn it over to Tristan to start the presentation. And remember, you can type your questions anytime in the questions pane, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can at the end of the presentation. All right. Tristan, you can go ahead. All right. Great. Uh, so thank you very much, Rosanna, and thanks uh, for Clean Coalition for hosting this. We really appreciate all the work and regulatory work that the Clean Coalition does to support renewable energy. And my presentation today is going to be how uh, these difficult to reach loads in homes uh, are really going to contribute to the grid of the future. And to be able to do that, we, the, the barrier has been to reach water heaters and thermostats in a cost-effective way. And um, so let me begin by just explaining a little bit about Skycentrics. Um, Skycentrics is really focused on a smart grid to buildings and buildings to grid. So the notion of helping buildings support the grid. And we do that both for residential buildings on the left with a, a CTA 2045 module which uh, my guess is right now, if I asked everybody, uh, have you ever heard of Wi-Fi? You'd say yes. Have you ever heard of CTA-2045? There might not be a lot in the crowd that have, and at the end of this presentation, hopefully uh, you'll be pretty excited about what CTA-2045 means for homeowners, building owners, et cetera. And secondly, we also do things for commercial buildings, trying to bring the Internet of Things into commercial buildings. You can see the difference between Wi-Fi and LoRa, for example. To cover a commercial building with Wi-Fi, you need a lot of repeaters and routers, and LoRa is a fairly magical new wireless where you can have one uh, router at the bottom of the building, and it goes all the way to the top in one shot. And uh, Skycentrics has really focused on open standards. So uh, CTA 2045 is an open standard, like a USB port for appliances. <clears throat> open ADR is an open standard for grid control signals. And Voltron is an open standard for building management systems. So <clears throat> uh, Skycentrics has this little Swiss Army knife in a box for commercial buildings. Uh, it's called the Sky Snap. You can see it plugged into the wall there. And uh, it's an exciting product 
because number one, it allows uh, our uh, manufacturing partners to very quickly be able to do open ADR and be certified. So we are one of the only companies that when you certify uh, that your water heater or your pool pump is works with our modules, then uh, the CTA 2045 modules that you see on the left, uh, there's an AC powered one and a DC powered one for things like thermostats, then you instantly become a open ADR certified product list. And that's becoming more and more important, especially in California, where open ADR has been a way for the grid to send signals to buildings and appliances and electric loads in buildings for almost over five years now. Uh, the way we use the SkySnap, and I'm just going to briefly talk about the SkySnap and then move on to CTA 2045. So the SkySnap, this, this slide was just shown yesterday to the California Energy Commission, and uh, it is where multifamily buildings have been complicated in the past. They have hot water heater systems that are very customized, and to be able to do things at grid scale, we need to have them sort of come in a more modular approach. So this is a skid that has been developed by Ecotope and Sandin water heaters. And uh, we are working with them to bring the SkySnap in as the device that can listen to grid signals and help these much bigger water heating loads be available to support the grid. Uh, and as an example, I'm going to be showing how an individual water heater is worth about 100 to 200 watts to the grid. That's like a 100 watt light bulb of the old light bulb style, whereas multifamily can be as much as 35,000 watts. So obviously multifamily is exciting, especially in California where new construction requires solar. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, just to give you an idea of, of what's happening in this multifamily space, this is a company in Hawaii that builds large solar over parking for uh, multifamily buildings. And uh, Hawaii, prior to this time, had a $2,000 water heater incentive where if a water heater could be shown to be linked to a solar panel or maybe even hot water uh, on the roof, then it would get a $2,000 rebate. So this company that does multifamily large solar arrays showed how they could control water heaters through our CTA 2045 module, and they were able to get $2,000 per water heater in rebates uh, for that multifamily installation. And frankly, I'm gonna be talking a lot about rebates that are coming in California and elsewhere because uh, somebody asked me before this presentation, I would love to get a heat pump water heater, but it's so much more expensive as a first cost, typically about $1,200, plus sometimes you need electric panel upgrades versus a $400 water heater. And uh, I know that it's much better for the environment and it's much less costly over time, but that first cost is a problem. So we're gonna be talking a lot about rebates that should help a lot with that. So, uh, if anybody has any questions about the multifamily, uh, feel free to throw them into the question area, but I'm going to be now talking about individual water heaters for residential single family buildings. And this CTA 2045 port was developed uh, about 10 years ago uh, by EPRI. The utilities came to the big OEMs like AO Smith and Ream and uh, for water heaters, for example, and said, hey, we really want to uh, be able to control the water heaters. We know that down the road, uh, being able to uh, control millions of appliances and have them turn on at the right time and off at the right time is gonna be very helpful. And so the manufacturer said, well, how do you wanna do that? Wi-Fi or Zigbee, et cetera. And they said, well, we have 3,000 utilities and every one of them might want to do it in a different way. And the manufacturer said, well, we can't have all these different SKU products in the marketplace. We're going to need a port where you can have the communications module be separate. So that's what you're seeing. It was developed by the Consumer Technology Association, which runs the CES Vegas show, uh, as well as the Electronic Power Research Institute. So 
Here you see our particular modules. On the left, that's an AC-powered version that typically goes into water heaters. On the left, a much smaller 5-volt power version for thermostats, for example. And I'll be showing you different ones. And the idea behind an open standard is that there are other companies that can make these modules and provide different features and maybe provide a cellular module or a smart meter mesh module. So that's the idea. It's a little bit like a USB port for appliances. So this is the CTA 2045 appliance family. And you can see that uh, we're pretty excited. Ream is the first water heater to have a native CTA 2045 port. They just released that in the last few months. Uh, Pentair uh, is a pool pump manufacturer that has uh, a controller that uses CTA 2045. Island Air PTAX at the top, Siemens electric vehicle chargers have uh, the DC powered version, and then Mitsubishi HVAC mini split systems also take the DC powered version. Uh, so the idea behind the, uh, the, the CTA 2045 is that the water heater can have its own smarts and just respond to grid signals that are being delivered by the module. So right now, what you're seeing is the green line up here is when the water heater is operating normally. Now, the little purple line is when we loaded up the water heater in the morning. We asked the water heater to turn on. And so the water heater turned on. You can see that 4,500 watts of an electric resistance water heater. And then we shed the water heater from six o'clock to nine o'clock. And um, at that point, the water heater is not coming on and you can see that the water heater is reporting its storage capacity in green. So it's cooling off, it has more and more storage capacity. And then all the way in the afternoon, we heated it up again and we turned it off from the five to nine period. That's important in California. These are the, the times when the grid has both an expensive electricity peak, a general peak, and a dirty carbon peak. So we, we shed it, we turned the water heater off, but the water heater has internal sensors, and this little red bar at the bottom here is, and you can see the water heater turned on to say, hey, I'm risking running out of hot water. I don't want the customer to have a cold water event. And it has its own internal smart so that it came on briefly to prevent a cold water event. So that's the exciting part of the CTA 2045 standard. And then here you can see our 24 seven repeating scheduler that's stored in the module. So up until now, water heaters have never been able to store a schedule. This is pretty exciting because the, the homeowner can run uh, just a general schedule for energy savings every day of the year. The homeowner can say, you know, now that I know my water heater has its own smarts and it'll maintain a certain amount of heat, then I can shed it from uh, six o'clock at night all the way till 5.30 in the morning. I'm gonna turn it on before I get up and make sure it's fully loaded for my morning showers. Then I'm gonna shed it. I'm helping the grid during this time. I'm gonna load it up again before the evening. And that's the only time I need to fire up that water heater. Now, the CTA 2045 regulations that are really turning this around so that instead of just hearing about this for the first time here, you're going to start hearing a lot more about it, um, are number one, Washington State in January 1 of 2021, all new electric water heaters sold in Washington State must have the CTA 2045 port. Uh, heat pump water heaters are going to be in 2022 but electric resistance will be in, in 2021. So obviously the big manufacturers of water heaters are, are having to deliver these ports inside the water heater for that time. Oregon has joined Washington. They're gonna start in 2022. And then California, all the way at the bottle, bottom, there's Title 24 JA13. And on July 8th, literally a week or two ago, they required that for new construction or large retrofit to be able to take advantage of certain incentives, 
uh, it's going to require a CTA 2045 port. The actual language says NIA Tier 3 version 7. That's a little bit uh, technical, but it basically requires that water heaters have a CTA 2045 port in large new construction and retrofit in California. And frankly, because of that, we feel like in the next Title 24 uh, laws in California, which will be in January 1, 2023, California will be the third state to mandate these water heaters uh, that have the CTA 2045 port. Now, I'm going to really dig into the incentives that are available nationwide for heat pump water heaters. Uh, as I said, they're typically $1,200, uh, and then sometimes they need a, more of an expensive install uh, and some other things like an electric panel upgrade, because if you have a gas water heater, you typically don't have 240 volts near your gas water heater. So this is nationwide sales, and you're seeing that... Uh, the stocking store in in the retail store a 500 dollars incentive in hawaii led to a large amount of sales maine is well known as having 60 percent of new water heaters in maine are heat pump they've done a really great job and then um it goes on but you're looking at the incentives and they're all between 500 and 750 dollars and they have been fairly effective but I'm going to talk about the new incentives that are coming into California that are very exciting and that are much larger than that even. So the reason that you're seeing these large incentives that I'm leaving on the screen right now for a bit in California is because California about 30 or 40 years ago decided that gas, number one, we made our own gas. There was a lot of gas in California. And number two, that it was actually a fairly, if you didn't, care about carbon, uh, there, that it was a very effective way to heat water locally with gas. But now, as we move to a low carbon future, California has realized that there's an incredible value to the 13 million water heaters, 95% of which are gas in California, if they could all be electric. And I'm going to be showing you that value as part of this presentation. So California is in a very difficult position. They have 13 million-ish water heaters that in the next 10 years, they want to say, at some point, you will not be able to buy a gas water heater at all, and we need to have them be electric. So you can see on the left the costs of, of, of a water heater being electric, right? The smart controls about 400 bucks, and I'm going to talk about uh, how much you get for that. The labor of putting it in a little bit higher for heat pumps, 700 to 1,000 dollars. The wiring that you might have to do to get 240 volts over there. Sometimes you need a panel upgrade. A lot of our California homes don't even have enough potentially to do another 244 volt uh, system like a water heater, and then the actual heat pump water heater itself. In this case, 1,500 dollars. So it's a $6,000 total installed cost in some cases. Now, many times, sometimes you don't need the electric panel upgrade. Meanwhile, uh, SGIP that you see in green here, that is a $400 million a year program for batteries to be deployed in California. It's the self-generation incentive program. Well, this year, the California Energy Commission dedicated 10% of that $400 million, $44 million, to be able to dedicate it to heat pumps, water heaters. So those are just coming off the presses and how much that incentive is going to be. But they're leaning towards, I've heard, as much as three to $4,000 just from that $40 million right there let alone some of these other things that you're seeing here. So for some of you who are policies and regulators and you know where to find these incentives, these are available and coming down the pike. But I wanted to refer to two in particular that have just launched. So Bayren is an organization in the Bay Area. They have a Home Plus program and they're doing $2,000 in incentives for heat pump water heaters in 11 Bay Area communities. So that's things like the CCAs, Sonoma Clean Power, East Bay Clean Energy, Marin Clean Energy, as well as uh, Palo Alto, San Jose, Silicon Valley. Sonoma Clean Power in particular is also adding another $750, especially for the uh, home reconstruction that's happening after fires. 
So if anybody has any questions about those, uh, we can certainly uh, get you the links to those and get you that information. Now, this is on the multifamily side. Remember, I talked about how the multifamily has 35,000 watt potential versus 300 watts or 100 watts even. And so you can see, obviously, it's more of an installed cost, but uh, there's a whole bunch of incentives for that as well. So let me just show you a little bit about the different uh, paths that CTA 2045 can take. So, um, the mandate in Washington says that we require the, the utilities to have a guaranteed communication path. And right now, Skycentrics, for example, has been making Wi-Fi modules, but we've been contracted to make a cellular module, and that helps guarantee the communications to the water heater independent of customer Wi-Fi. Most of you probably know of sort of utility incentives and controls in residential around thermostats, Nest and Echobee thermostats being the primary means. And there's two issues with that. Number one, if your thermostat is being managed by a utility and changed by two to four degrees, you typically can feel that on a hot day. Whereas a water heater can maintain its heat for 10 to 12 hours. So when your water heater heats water, doesn't really matter to you. But at the same time, um, the water heater is not something, I know I control my thermostat with voice and it's really nice. I adjust it a little bit, I turn it on in the morning, I don't need it on every day. So communicating and controlling my thermostat with a mobile or a voice app is very exciting. People buy water heaters, they make sure it's the right temperature, and they never think about it for the next 10 to 15 years. And they certainly don't think about adjusting the temperature or fiddling with it with a mobile app. So it's been very difficult to try and get the manufacturers to provide these mobile apps. And frankly, the manufacturers, even when they've provided Wi-Fi, uh, people don't always sign up. So uh, a mandated utility path is what you're seeing on the left. And then some OEMs will provide the optional path of their own, but this also helps smaller OEMs that might not have the resources to build their Internet of Things cloud and their mobile apps. They can just provide one simple interface and let the module makers like Skycentrics and others provide the web and voice control apps that we do. You can control a Mitsubishi Mini Split and an Island Air PTAC with Alexa voice control. So uh, I'm going to skip this slide because I've already covered it, and I'm going to move over here to the cellular module that's coming. So for $20 to $36 a year per water heater, we can provide that kind of daily connectivity that allows the water heater to be adjusted, and I'm going to show you why there's incredible value to that. So typically, most people think about supporting the grid with storage batteries, pumped hydro, and you can imagine that uh, that's fairly expensive. I mean, if anybody's bought a Tesla Powerwall, it's about uh, typically $800 per kilowatt, uh, and, uh, and, and what we're going to show you is that water heaters are anywhere from $100 to $400 per kilowatt hour of storage. So, here, demand management is about half the cost. And why do we need grid-connected water heaters? Well, this is how we're typically meeting utility peaks. If you know about the California duck curve, we're meeting it with peaker power plants. So this is an $800 per kilowatt peaker power plant. It's a 300 megawatt plant. It costs about $240 million first cost to build. And our choices to justify that resource are to build the plant, to provide a short-term solution in the wholesale market, or to meet that peak with demand response. And I'm going to show you how 13 million water heaters can really do that. And heat pump water heaters can come on at the right time instead of the random time that they've historically been on. And I'm going to show you how a schedulable and manageable heat pump water heater, if 13 million are done, can be worth nine to 20 billion dollars annually to the California grid. And we believe they'll reduce the grid emissions by over six percent a year. That's like taking 800,000 cars off the grid every year. 
So let me begin a little bit, and this is where it gets technical with graphing. I'm going to show you a couple of different ways and, and how these are all being calculated so that these really high incentives for a market transformation to 13 million electric water heaters can happen in California over the next 10 years. So what you're looking right now is the actual CO2 emissions. Now I'm going to map these CO2 emissions to the actual electricity usage on the grid, but I start with CO2 because more and more people are increasingly concerned about CO2. Now look at the August 15th CO2, that's this brown one up here, and you're seeing that it really peaks out uh, much higher than the other times. August and September are the challenging months for California. And it has a double peak. It has a morning peak in light blue from 6 to 8 a.m. And it has a green peak from 5 to 9 p.m. But it also starts quite a bit earlier, whereas these blue and purple lines only start at 3 o'clock in the afternoon to go ramping up to a much dirtier carbon emissions grid. So that's the differences in time, which is why a lot of people know that time of use scheduling is coming. But the time of use scheduling, if you look at this graph, 5 to 9 p.m., which is really the green bar, doesn't address all of the dirty grid that's increasing right here some months all the way at noon and even 10.30 in the morning. So having a water heater or any resource that can be flexible and has a scheduled change every day is going to be important. Here's another way to view that. So this is 12 months of California assumed marginal CO2 emissions. Now look at the, the again, you're seeing five o'clock on April. Yeah, five o'clock, it's green all the way until five o'clock in April, the fourth line down. But then if you go down to August, you're seeing that no, it's really only green at like four o'clock. So, and it starts at different times in the morning as well. So again, if we can adjust that on a daily basis rather than a large TOU schedule, that's more of a blunt instrument, there's a lot more value. And here's another way of looking at that. You can see that here's our energy, here's the classic duck curve in red, but then we have increased transmission costs that are all happening in that five to 9 p.m. slot. And finally, this is from SMUD. Uh, Owen Howlett presented this only a week ago, and it shows that if you do time of use scheduling, that's this bottom row, and the value to society in the grid is a dollar's worth. Uh, those are just like restaurant, uh, it's not one dollar, but it's you know a small amount. And the value to the customer, we can actually provide incentives to the customer that are two dollar signs worth. But if it's controlled on a daily basis, either on a daily basis with that schedule adjust or on a real-time basis, it's worth $3 worth of dollar signs to the society and the utilities and the grid. And then value to the customer, it's a little trickier to identify. And this is more details on how there's customer bill savings if you optimize and there's 35 to 60% of utility savings. Finally, last thing on time of use and why we want more granular controls than time of use. Here is an SDG&E comparison of, of a variety of their feeder stations. And look at this bottom one in the right corner at the bottom. What you're seeing is that that is much opposite to what we're seeing in terms of the normal behavior, right? So if you take this red, which is what is actually the time of use schedule, um, you're seeing that in white, that's the actual load that's happening on that feeder station. So if you had uh, water heaters that were time of use scheduled, they would be making that system worse. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. This, this orange bar down at the bottom is the heat pump water heater load profile of a heat pump water heater running, as you can see, the kilowatt lines on the side, about 100 watts to 200 watts over a 24-hour period. And it makes sense that between midnight and 6 in the morning, there's not a lot of heating going on to that water. Then people get up in the shower, there's a little peak in the morning, and there's a peak in the evening. And it matches up very much with the blue and green bars that I described earlier. 
So now imagine if we could take that 100 watt light bulb of 13 million water heaters and switch them over to heating in the morning and heating in the day when there's the sun shining, maybe wind blowing as well in the morning, and certainly when the grid is a lot cleaner. Now here's that August line where you're seeing how these squares match up and how much it would be beneficial to be heating the water heater at a different time. So similarly, here we've mapped that August 15th line to the, this green line on top is the net, is the demand of the California grid. And then the purple line is what happens if you count in the solar and renewables generation. So the purple line is the actual net demand of the California grid. Look at how the CO2 matches almost exactly with the net demand line. So the dirty CO2 generation on our grid is similar to that 5 to 9 p.m. area. Now look what happens when you stick the water heater load profile of an average water heater. Similarly, you've got an increase in load here, but you could put that all the way to zero with these controls, same thing in the morning, and similarly to how I move my squares, now I've showed what it would do to the grid, right? You would remove from the net demand curve on the entire California grid, you would lower it by that amount, literally, and move it over to these sections here, same thing in the morning, without any impact on customer comfort and huge impact towards the grid. Now, what I'm going to do now is skip forward to uh, the numbers and the value and how we calculate that value. And then all of this, so just so everybody knows what's coming up, this was all about water heaters and Smarter Grid Solutions is going to show how in Tucson, they actually coordinated a lot more than water heaters. They coordinated the EV charger, the solar inverter, the Ecobee thermostat and how that can provide even more value. But I'm going to finish with showing you the amount of money that this can mean to California over the whole. So Massachusetts did a very powerful research report on how the peak of the grid that needs to be met just a few times during the year, look at this, the top 1% most expensive hours accounted for 8% of the annual spend and the top 10% of hours accounted for 40% of the annual spend, which was $3 billion a year. Now the California grid is five times bigger than the Massachusetts grid. So we're just going to do a little math here. We're gonna interpolate, right? So let's just say that the top 10% of hours now is worth $15 billion. 13 million managed heat pump water heaters can shave 3.3% off of that peak every day. Not just of the 10% of hours, but every day, but it'll certainly hit the 10% of hours. That means we get a value of 5 billion annually. Of course, the only problem is California's water heaters are gas right now. So that's why California is really interested in market transformation to getting them to be electric. So this is a big tech screen here of why the CTA 2045 port is critical. If you're going to control 13 million water heaters and have them be bomb proof and secure, customer Wi-Fi has a large amount of devices dropping off. Duke Energy installed 70,000 water heater switches to be able to replace their 400,000 water heater switches that have been running in operation for 40 years. Believe it or not, there's 8 million water heaters in the United States right now that are controlled by old radio controlled load control switches. And every month, Duke was losing 10% of the water heaters. So you can imagine if you're providing 5 billion of value, you need a guaranteed connection to that water heater. So low cost cellular, smart meter mesh and other communications paths are coming, the CTA 2045 port guarantees that a utility at any time can send a new uh, module to that water heater in a very inexpensive way to move towards a lower cost, more guaranteed communications. And I just want to finish with the fact that we're going to have a number of resources available uh, in our deck. These are where all the reports and the numbers are. And uh, if you have any questions or want to contact me and, or Skycentrics in any way, there's our contact information. So uh, we really appreciate the time. I hope everybody can take advantage of the rebates that I showed, especially if you're living in the Bay Area. 
If you have a CCA, for example, some of them that are happening in the San Luis Obispo area, they should be releasing their own incentives for heat pump water heaters. But uh, we're excited about having California join Washington and Oregon and, and make water heaters a big part of supporting renewables on the grid and lowering our carbon uh, emissions. And with that, uh, I'm passing back to you, Roseanne. Great, thank you, Tristan. I'm gonna pass it over to Craig now. Okay, go ahead, Craig. Excellent, thanks very much. Are we visible? Great, looks good, Craig, we can see your You can see it, excellent. Uh, thanks very much, um, Rosanna, for having me. Um, thanks for the, to the Clean Coalition, and that was a great um, presentation, Tristan. I think it actually sets up very nicely what we're about to talk to. Um, very much interested in the the benefits and the the uh, savings, the financial savings, the carbon savings that can be used uh, realised by uh, introducing the CT2045 standard. So what I'm about to talk to is um, a real world example um, of that being used um, in coordination with OpenADR. Um, but not only that, it's um, a wider array of devices um, that are used at Project and Project RAIN. Um, so I'm conscious of time, so I will very quickly go through the background, um, who Smarter Grid Solutions are. So we uh, formed in 2008, commercialised to uh, test uh, a control strategy which in increased hosting capacity um, and tested flexible interconnection arrangements um, in a group of islands in the, off the north coast of Scotland and the UK, um, very successful in the UK um, and tested as has been rolled out to uh, a number of the distribution network operators there. Um, my colleagues, uh, Tim McDuffie and General Manager Pete uh, Malbec, gave a presentation last month actually on Derms and our platform. Uh, so I would encourage people to take a look at that if they, they want to see more about uh, Smarter Grid Solutions. So. We've been in the, the North America um, for since 2013, I've done some projects on the East Coast with Con Ed, Avangrid, Hydro One, and more recently a microgrid project at Hydro Quebec. Um, we have been at the national labs, NREL, LBNL, uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, um, as well as some co projects in the West Coast, as well as uh, in Arizona with Tucson Electric Power. And through this, um, we have had a lot of experience um, controlling various DER types. So, um, and not, not uh, various in this project in Tucson, with Tucson, we have got our our batteries that we're we're controlling um, PV and uh, various types of loads. One of which being the water heater that Tristan uh, was speaking to, but we also have thermostats and uh, electric vehicle chargers. And just a small uh, point, and this is a, our our layered control strategy. So, um, for the the Tucson Electric Power Project, we had AM Strata, and it has um, two layers where we have preventative control layers, so we can do things like optimize, generate schedules, um, and then also also manually uh, send set points to DER. If those set points may cause uh, violations within your utility, then there's the corrective control layer, which operates in real time and can respond to real time conditions. Um, and then at the device level, um, we have for larger DER uh, on the utility grid, a uh, fail safe control layer, which will um, monitor and manage the, the DER that we're controlling. Okay. And then just a very quick track record of our different use cases. There's grid management, flexibility services, microgrid um, projects, um, and various non wireless alternative projects. So, uh, Tucson Electric Power. 
TP um, are a utility in Arizona with a um, uh, customer base of approximately 400,000. And what they really wanted to do um, was understand what it meant to implement DERMS. So with EPRI, um, they, we, they ran this trial project. Um, for us, it started at, uh, at during, in a lab phase where we were able to test our SunSpec Modbus adapter, our OpenADR adapter, um, and move on from there. So effectively, it became a living lab where they had 12 homes. Um, so we can see our, we've got 12 um, PV panels that we can control, um, six of the water heaters that Tristan was talking about. 12 thermostats um, and six sewn in batteries. Um, also, in part of the trial was the TP headquarters, which had additional um, PV um, and electric vehicles. And here's a more detailed look at the architecture. So, I want to just stick at this one for a second. So, um, the AM Strata was a cloud hosted instance, um, and this was used um, to provide an interface for the operator um, to control all of the devices down here. So um, it has a, an interface which allows you to schedule set points um, or um, manually control individual devices. So what really made this possible and what we're really looking at here um, is the, the SunSpec pro protocol, SunSpec Modbus protocol, and the OpenADR protocol. Um, we did have a proprietary uh, REST um, connection to the battery. Um, yeah. So we had the, the PV inverters that were supplied by Fronis, which supported SunSpec Modbus. Um, we had the PV at home, PV at home, yep, um, water heater and thermostat. So the, the OpenADR adapter, that spoke both to the sky centric cloud, which could then translate to CTA 2045 and down to the water heaters, or they would uh, translate that command uh, to send a, a command to the Echo B thermostat. Um, and then open ADR would also be used to send controls to the green lot cloud, which converted it to OCCP and down to the EV charger. So very um, introductory look at what is the, di the different protocols are. So SunSpec Modbus, um, Modbus itself has been around for uh, since the late seventies. It was developed. Um, it was used as a tele a serial tele control protocol in the eighties and nineties. Um, it then became TCP/IP at some point, and even now a lot of manufacturers still sp support native Modbus. But as uh, smart functions and uh, emerged on uh, PV inverters, um, it made sense to have a, a standardised model which could help you realise um, sort of the benefits of having a, a common interface on on um, the inverter. OpenADR um, was slightly different. It had a virtual top, it has a virtual top node, so that's what essentially we are in in this instance, a virtual top node, and we can generate demand response events which are pulled by the, the virtual end node, which was, again, let's get back, the sky centric is cloud and the green lots cloud. So they would pull the, the VTN for events um, and we would generate them. And then proprietary API calls are sort of custom HTTP commands that are sent down to the battery. So our experience with Sunset Spec Modbus was very good. Um, I wrote plug and play ish because there's always going to be an element of uh, manual configuration required. Um, but it was reasonably simple to configure. There was maybe an upfront cost of um, doing the first few. Um, but there's very good benefits to be realized. So the first few maybe took us a few days. Um, but thereafter, it became a very quick and seamless project uh, uh, prospect to connect more. So realistically, the you could connect uh, hundreds, if not thousands, without any additional uh, configuration, which is really powerful. It scales very well. I uh, one one small note at the bottom is we did see some uh, interesting behaviour 
when there was different firmwares involved. So um, depending on the firmware, some would retain their set point overnight, others wouldn't, for instance. Um, for OpenADR, we implemented a, a simple level mapping. So this allowed us to connect, create a, an event for levels 0, 1, 2, and 3. Um, the interpretation of what those levels meant uh, to the individual asset under control was down to the VEN to decide. Uh, in this instance, the VEN being Skycentrics or Green Lots, they then had to interpret that level um, and send it down to the individual asset. The implementation guide for open ADR is maybe a little less prescriptive, so there's uh, a degree of coordination required between a VTN and VEN to understand what, what part of the protocol we're going to use. So, like, for instance, um, if you want to individually target a device, you could use resource ID. If you wanted a, a group of devices to be part of a, a demand response program, you could have them all respond to a, a market context. and. Throughout the process, we did see um, differing assumptions between ourselves and uh, Green Lots or Sky Centrics, and there was a degree of coordination required to make sure that we we were in alignment there. But it, it provides a very flexible platform for doing demand response programs. And then the sonar and batteries, I won't say too much. It's, it was very easy to control them, but it wasn't. This doesn't scale. It's a vendor specific solution. So we can't, it's not feasible really um, to have hundreds of different types of vendors um, and configure to them individually. All right. So TP and EPRI um, also sort of laid the challenge down to us and we are very thankful for, for, for them to do so because uh, it forced us to sort of think about how we um, harmonize. Um, and control various different uh, device types. So here we have um, solar batteries, um, and that's fine if you want to individually send set points down to them if you've got a small number. But in this instance, we had in the order of approximately 30 devices, I think, which even then became impractical. So you really want to be able to group these um, and control them um, as a as a group based on various things that might be that you want to group device types, you might want to group um, individual homes, you might want to group what's going on in the feeder. So we had to develop a way of harmonizing the control um, such that it sent down um, the, the controls to the different devices. And the way we done that was um, we had we borrowed the concept of, of a level, um, which meant that if you wanted to set a level to um you could have that there's a translation layer which allowed us to uh interpret that at the the top end before it got sent down to the devices so um level one for instance might mean that a battery uh charges at 50 percent of its rating for instance and that's just an example um but what it did do is mean that we have a, a single operator action which can control tens if not hundreds of devices um, and give you the capability of creating heterogeneous groups. Um, so, you may, as I said, by home, by feeder, and it might even be by commercial arrangement, what one of the most financially beneficial to, to control. So, key uh, takeaways that we got from the project was um, that DERMs can reduce complexity for an operator. So, um, Tristan's already spoke about the benefits of, of water heaters. Um, and I think even more benefits, we've not done the numbers, but I'm sure even more benefits would be realised if you could coordinate that with, with various DER, um, different types of load um, and different assets on your grid. Um, Standardisation certainly goes a long way to scaling these types of deployments. Um, we learned through the, the TEP project that um, your initial one or two um, devices, once you get through the hump, you can then connect hundreds of devices, or we potentially could with with minimal um, minimal issues, as well as being especially given it's a, in a, a cloud environment where you're not resource constrained. Um, though I would say standardization is not doesn't mean that you get interoperability or you have unplug and play out, out of the box. There is a, certainly a degree of 
of uh, customization that may still be required. Um, and for us, we learned um, collaborate with other vendors early to align expectations and make sure that we are frequently testing to make sure that we we can uh, communicate well. And uh, I've not spoken too much about the uh, outcomes of the project. I'll, I'll leave that, that to as a learning report, a, a final report that was produced by EPRI. Um, I would recommend taking a look at that. If anyone wants to contact me, here's my, my contact details. Great. Thank you, Craig and Tristan. These are great presentations. We've had some questions coming in. And for anyone who's still on, if you have any further questions, you can feel free to keep entering them in the questions pane. I'm going to start out with a question from Alexander Eschley, from, uh, who does rate design at Southern California Edison. Would the scenario described early in the presentation, so this was in Tristan's presentation, would that be possible with a unit without a resistance heating element? And he's also asking, um, is that possible to do with a heat pump? Right. So uh, everything I showed, which was frankly quite low, right, 100 watt bulb, 200 watts, was a heat pump water heater in pure heat pump mode. Uh, m uh, right now, I believe almost all heat pump water heaters are shipping with an electric element so that they can heat up quickly if the customer needs hot water quickly. And the customer can put them into hybrid mode or electric element only mode or heat pump mode. So the numbers I showed were a heat pump water heater in heat pump only mode. Um, if you have an electric element, what's interesting is sometimes you can, you know, load it up with a 4,500 watts versus a heat pump is using about 860 watts typically. Uh, great. Well, we have uh, another question from Aram Andresian, product owner at LO3 Energy, which is, does CTA 2045 account for the transition to tankless water heaters? Will that reverse the trend in the name of demand response? So that's really interesting. Tankless water heaters provide zero benefit to the grid, so they're never going to be incentivized in any way. Now, ironically, at the hot water heater forum, which is happening right now, uh, there's certainly some installers who have said, you know, the tricky part about tankless water heaters is, one, uh, people think that they're being efficient because they only heat the water when you need them. Two, uh, they think that um, they think that it's the uh, only heat water when you need them, and that um, uh, so let me just describe the problem with them. Uh, number one, if they're electric, which everything needs to be electric, we just the world is going to have to stop burning anything at some point. Uh, if you believe that, then an electric one to be able to heat water that fast takes huge amounts of energy. Um, and there is no benefit to the grid. So, oh, I remember the, the last thing that the installer said is the problem is that people who own them love them. So it, it is going to be a market transformation education process where, where people say, look, here's the benefits. Here's why we're incentivizing water heaters, because they provide something everyone needs, which is hot water, but they do it in a way that supports the grid that we all want, both for society and, frankly, uh, individually. So. It's a really good question, but um, we're we're gonna have to have less, fewer tankless water heaters and more tanked water heaters. Thanks. And uh, related to that, uh, you were talking about how people love their tankless water heaters. We have a question from Tanya Barham at Community Energy Labs, who's asking. How do these systems incorporate customer choice, preferences, and overrides? I was wondering the same thing when you were talking about the um, settings for for the water heater. What if I wanted to take a shower at a different time of the day? But in general, how how do these systems incorporate customer choice? Sure. So the biggest pilots were done by Bonville Power Association with 400 water heaters over a period of a year. And that report is well known, and that's what triggered the Washington state law. So they had something like 97% customer satisfaction with the program. 
essentially the water heaters are so well insulated after 30 years of Energy Star, and all of these incentives are for Energy Star certified water heaters, and um, they basically keep the water hot for 10 to 20 to 10 to 12 hours. So when you heat them, it doesn't matter that much. I mean, I mentioned about the cold water prevention and uh, so that it even comes on and tops itself off, but there, there are very few. There was another uh, panel this morning that was presenting and uh, Portland General Electric is, is doing multifamily water heater control. Again, 97% customer satisfaction. Uh, out of 9,000 installed water heaters, they've had like two customers who reported a, a shower not lasting as long as they wanted. Uh, so interesting, so they are doing water heater management without notifying the customer because they're doing it every day. There are other programs where the customer gets notified. Certainly the Skycentrics platform delivers uh, an email or a text message, if desired, by the program to the customer saying, we're running an event. Uh, that's for DR events that have typically happened 10 to 20 times a year during the hottest days of the year. But the real value to the grid, as I was saying, was that daily adjustment, sh literally shifting the load so it doesn't happen between 5 to 9 p.m. or 3 to 9 p.m. and 7 to 9 a.m. And if you have that water heater fully loaded right before your six o'clock, it's fully loaded then, and it's still mildly loaded at other times. So you can still typically have the hot, the hot shower. Um, however, there are almost all demand response programs to answer your question specifically, have typically provided for overrides. Certainly our apps and our web and mobile apps, even voice control, you can say, please override it. I don't want to participate in this event. But as I said earlier, the, the studies are showing that managed water heaters uh, essentially don't impact customer comfort. Great. And just to clarify, Tanya has a follow-up. I meant not just customer choice for CTA 2045, but for the DERMs. Can you comment on that? Um, so that is interesting, right? A DERMs is typically being used by either the utility or an aggregator or even eventually potentially the California ISO, for example, and or Bonville Power, a big T&D, right? And they can't really have multiple DERMs. They want one button and one control panel to control things. So I'm not quite sure why you would want DERMs choices at the customer level. Uh, certainly, you might want to have the CTA 2045 gives you a choice where if you replace your module with a different module that goes to a different vendor, then you're essentially saying, I have a different choice. Um, but if you want the incentives provided by Sonoma Clean Power, for example, they're going to say, hey, you have to use the module that we're incentivizing. And if you take the module off and use a different module, you're going to have to get incentives from someone else. We're not going to provide that incentive anymore because we're no longer connected to your water heater, which again shows how innovation is generated by a CTA 2045 universal port. So that was a great question. Great. Thanks. Uh, here's a good one from Alice Sung, principal at Green Banks Associates. Do current commercial central uh, heat pump water heaters have these CTA 2045 type open ADR ports and or could these controllers be retrofitted onto any commercial scale hot water heat pumps? So basically it's a question about what's out there now and can the ones that are already in place be retrofitted? Yeah, so we are definitely, that's what that SkySnap product we have originally. So we're working, Seattle has building codes that require multifamily buildings to have a sort of utility connected signal capabilities to those large water heating systems in multifamily and other places. And so we're working with uh, mechanical contractors up there and the big central heat pump water heater manufacturers like Colmac and Sandin to provide a very low cost uh, minimum viable product through our SkySnap. So that's coming out that will be able to retrofit a large variety of central heat pump systems. Uh, for them to have a CTA 2045 port, a Sandin is hoping to do that so that they can comply with the Washington state law. So that's coming as well. Great. Uh, we're at noon, but if you guys have a couple minutes for a couple more questions, we can keep going. Uh, Craig and I do, yes. Great. 
so Craig, here's a question to you from Lane Sharman, which is, what elements of the architecture still need important improvements? Hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, needs improvements. So really, uh, the architecture for us was the the, um, the Sunspec Modbus adapter, the Open ADR VTN, um, and the uh, proprietary REST command. So, in in the ideal world, we we don't have proprietary um, API calls. I mean, that's work that we will no longer, unless we ever control another Sonnen battery, we won't really get to reuse that, and that won't be part of our, our product offering. Um, the Open ADR VTN um, for us um, was very much accelerated. It was on our roadmap, um, but the TEP project brought that to the, the front. So there's definitely more that we can we can do to make that um, more flexible um, and realize more of the, the benefits of a, an open ADR um, demand response type program. Um, there was one small sort of thing where you've got the two different sort of competing control, control strategies. Um, so with the, the inverters, Typically, um, you would send a set point, and it would continue at that set point until you told it otherwise. Whereas with Open ADR, you've got a, a duration. Um, so, to try and harmonise the two of those, we set up a fixed duration um, of an hour. Um, so, if our our schedule would uh, was only set at hour long uh, time steps, there's a potential for a small so a, um, window where you've got an expired event um, and you're you're waiting for the, the VEN the VEN to, to pull and get the next event. So there's like small efficiency things there, but generally speaking, um, the the architecture is how I think we would like to continue going forward and and making small improvements upon that. And then there's also the potential to to layer on um, additional sort of optimizations and things like that above above what we were, were doing. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll get to one final question from Jan Greiger, Chief Rates Analyst at PG&E, who also points out that SoCal Gas is providing rebates for tankless gas water heaters, and asks, how about the 120 volt heat pump water heaters? Aren't they coming, and wouldn't they make the install cost a lot lower? Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. So again, a lot of this information was hot off the presses with work that's happening in California. So California for a year has been implementing what's called the Advanced Water Heater Initiative to sort of really harmonize all of the rebates and the incentives. And the, and the biggest innovation is that it asked, because it knew that electric panel upgrades were challenging and expensive, it asked the manufacturers to make 110 volt plug in the wall heat pump water heater. Now that's quite challenging um, because they really have to pass Energy Star requirements to be able to heat water up to a certain amount from a cold start. I believe that's how that certification works. But um, all the manufacturers have been working on this. And so that's really going to help. And yes, I understand that SoCal Gas for sure rebates. Uh, instant water heaters because they use massive amounts of gas. And SoCal Gas is obviously facing decarbonization and electrification incentives. So they're trying to get as much gas use ramped up as possible. But um, in terms of, uh, you know, electric, electric tankless water heaters will never be incentivized. Great, thank you. I think we'll have to stop the questions there. But thank you so much, Tristan and Craig, for your excellent presentation. And thanks to all of you for joining today. As I mentioned, we will send everyone the webinar recording and slides within a couple of days. And we will also post those on our website, clean-coalition.org, under events. You can go to uh, past events to see that. And you can go to upcoming events to see what's coming up. I want to point out that our next webinar, which is going to be hosted by the Clean Energy Group, is coming up on Tuesday, August 11th. 
uh, at 10 a.m. Pacific time, and that's going to be on a new critical low tiering approach to valuing resilience in solar plus storage microgrids. You don't want to miss this one. It's something you're not going to see anywhere else. You can go to our website to sign up for that and see other upcoming events. So thank you again for joining us today and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.